Good morning, and thank you for attending Genuine Origins webinar, Sustainability and Social Impact in Uganda Coffee Farming. My name is Rob Sulkow. I'm the Digital Marketing Manager at Genuine Origin. It's a pleasure to be hosting and moderating this webinar. Introducing the program, uh, this morning we will look at our coffee sustainability projects in Uganda. We will hear about Chagalani's Coffee, Chagalani Coffee Limited, our sister company in Uganda, and about the work they are doing to promote child education in Uganda. Afterwards, we'll take a high level view of the Vol Cafe Way, our company's own farm sustainability program. We'll then dive into the Vol Cafe Way program in Uganda and learn about what it is like to work directly with coffee farmers to achieve farm sustainability. After the presentation, We'll have some time to take questions. Please use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Our speakers for today, in the order that we will hear from them, are Dr. Annika Fermont. She is the Regional Sustainability Manager for Volcafe in East Africa. She's based in Uganda, where she leads the sustainability department for Chagalani Coffee Limited, working with over 21,000 coffee farming households. Annika is an industry representative on the UTS RA Standards Committee since 2013. She holds an MSc in Soil Science and a PhD in Agronomy from and I hope I get this right, Wageningen University in the, in the Netherlands. Before joining the coffee sector, she worked for 13 years as an agricultural scientist with several CGIAR institutes in Uganda and Senegal and with the university in South Africa. Next, we'll hear from Carlos Ortiz, who's the general uh, who's the Global Volcafe Way Manager. Carlos studied at Earth University to become an agronomist and later obtained an MSc in agribusiness. In his 12 years in coffee, Carlos has worked in uh, worked to integrate sustainability into the core operations of Volcafe while helping pro coffee producers become more sustainable and profitable. Carlos aims to create a global consciousness across the coffee sector that sustainability must go beyond certified supply chains. Finally, we'll hear from Mattia Muguera. He is an agronomy coordinator at Volcafe Way um, and Volcafe Way field technician at Chagalani Coffee in Uganda. Uh, Mattia has worked in coffee for six years. In that time, he has trained 560 coffee producers in the Volcafe Way methodology. He's also established and is currently working on implementations for 24 business model farms. His work with coffee farmers has influenced a three times increase in yield of coffee cherries. So without further ado, I'm going to pause my screen share and Annika, we welcome you to share. Stop sharing your screen before I can start sharing mine. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Annika Fairmont, as Rob just introduced me, and I want to give you an introduction in the work that Chagalani does uh, in Uganda in supporting its farmers. Um, Uganda is located in East Africa, as I'm sure most of you know, um, and we operate a range of uh, sustainability uh, schemes in Uganda. Um, Uganda has about 1.7 million smallholders. Uh, we hardly have any estates, and we export between four to four and a half million bags of coffee per year of which 75% is robust and 25% is Arabica. We have seen a significant growth in exports in the, five, in the past five years, about 60%. And the quality of our Arabica production is really improving a lot. It's uh, currently approaching Kenya. So we see more and more speci speciality buyers come to Uganda. But we also face challenges. We have our, a lot of our farms are very low productivity levels. A lot of our farmers really don't know much about coffee agronomy and they definitely don't have a business mindset. And then we have a range of social issues we have to deal with. 
Chakalani as an export is the number one exporter in Uganda and we've exported about 17% last year. Uh, we're quite strong in the washed Arabic as where we do over 50% of total exports. We have a dry mill in Kampala and then operations across the country. As I said before, we have four sustainable coffee schemes. Three of those are located in Arabica area, areas. We have the Mount Ogun scheme, the West Nile scheme and the Rowenzori scheme. And those support over 21,000 smallholder Arabica farmers. You can see the details uh, on the slide. And we also recently started a commercial Robusta scheme to, support, uh, to expand our support services to Robusta farmers. Uh, we use a range of certifications, as you can see, and total certified volumes that we're able to produce is about 5,000 metric tons last year. Um, so we provide a whole range of services. Um, the first is where we always start with is uh, improving the access to processing equipment uh, with the main aim to improve quality because quality gains you can make within a few years. Um, we do this in two ways. We construct washing stations. Uh, so every uh, scheme we have several washing stations and we provide hand pulpers to farmers so they can do home processing of, par of, uh, of parchment. Then we provide a whole range of agronomy trainings that's really core to whatever we do. And it links in very well with what Volcafe Way also promotes, as you will hear later. Um, this is to improve coffee production and profits for farmers. Last year, we uh, ran over 21,000 individual household trainings where our field staff visit individual households uh, to really advise them at their own farms what are the next steps to, they can do to improve coffee production. Um, then we also have group agronomy trainings where we can focus on uh, particular topics, uh, for example, rejuvenation or soil fertility management, and really dig into the details. We run these trainings in over 800 demo plots. Uh, and last year we ran, we ran over 2,500 group trainings. We also have set up uh, 31 Vocafe Way business model farms across the country. Uh, and Mattia will share more details about that. Then we run a range of special projects. We have a project on gender uh, where we really aim to uh, help households to improve uh, joint decision making where husband and wife are making decisions together instead of the husband making all the decisions. Um, we currently target 4,200 farmers in, with this program and we have set up 140 saving groups where the families can save money and then reinvest in coffee. We have also developed a whole range of tools to help households think about joint decision making and plan their farms, for example. Then we have a project on uh, targeting youth. Uh, we have set up 35 coffee youth teams that provide commercial farm management services to our farmers. This has created employment for over 124 youth. Um, and uh, it also really pushes adoption of rejuvenation and fertilizer. Uh, use. So um, management practices that require either um, expensive equipment or require uh, more knowledge. And then we have our child education project that started in West Nile in 2014, uh, of which I will share more later. Just quickly looking at the impact of our sustainability programs. In Mount Elgin and West Nile, the areas where we have worked for longest, we have seen in the last uh, six to 10 years, yield increases between, or average yield increases of 50 to 70% uh, across our farmer community. Uh, in terms of prices and premiums, we have been able to uh, give Im improved prices by uh, between 15 and 25% for premiums, uh, for quality premiums, and three to 5% for the Woods premium. So if you take that together, average coffee income uh, for, the, for our households has improved by 70 to 115 percent over time. So those are quite significant uh, increases in income. That brings me to our child education project. Um, so this project started in West Nile in 2014, or no, the project started in 2015, because when we started working in 2014 in West Nile, um, we realized quite quickly there was a lot of children out of school or partly out of school. And as for the definitions of ILO and certification standards, if a child of school going age is not in school, this is considered child labor. 
Um, so it's quite important to know that the type of child labor that we find in Uganda is, is very different from the, the type of child labor that you would find in Latin America, where it's more linked to uh, farmers hiring children uh, for cheap labor or children doing dangerous work. We see very little of that in Uganda. For us, it's really um, focusing on getting children back into school. Now, the root causes of the type of child labor that we find in Uganda is poverty. Um, that's why you only find it in some areas in your, of Uganda and not in all. Like in Mount Elgin, we don't see any of this, uh, this type of child labor. But in West Nile, we see it as uh, poverty is, is important. People only have about 580 coffee trees on average. So income from coffee is not that much. And there is very poor market access for other crops than coffee. In addition, the quality of the schools in the area is really, is really poor. I mean, you see a picture below of a teacher with her class. I mean, a class could easily have about 150 children for one teacher. Um, and then finally, the, the accessibility of schools is also poor because there's relatively few schools in, in the area. So why do we work on this team? So when we realized that we had, um, in 2014, we started inspecting our farmers and then we quickly realized between five and 8% of the households uh, had children out of school. That is what we identified initially in our own internal inspections. We said, okay, this is a problem. We have to start working on it. Uh, because the options we really had was either we could hide it, a lot of our competitors are doing so, but we felt that's not really the right way forward. Um, we could also remove households that were affected by child labor, but then you leave these people in poverty. Um, we don't really want to do that. So we decided just to dive into it and start a project. Um, so we set up a project first in 2015 and then a second phase project in two, started in 2018. And we work with a range of partners, including Uts Rainforest and Hibos, which are our donors, uh, local government, uh, a local NGO called Sefet, and a teacher union in the area. And we all have different responsibilities, as you can see on this screen, uh, but we all have the same message that children need to be in school. So Chakalani's role focuses very much on the identification of, uh, of child labor during household mapping and counseling households and improving household income. Then the NGO works much more on building community awareness and linking with local government. And the teacher union is focusing on improving the, the environment of schools and remedial teaching and identification of, of children that are out, uh, dropping out of school. So how do we approach this? When we work at farm level, we actually map all the households in our area on a yearly basis uh, with staff uh, that are called child labor liaison officers. So they visit all the households and they identify during that visit, uh, they start a discussion with the household to identify which children are not in school. Um, it was very important as we do this work together with Sefford staff that we have a uniform mapping format so it becomes easy to monitor children over time and we developed a central database to capture all our findings so we can easily share this and analyze it. Once we have realized that a, a household has child labor issues we revisit a household uh, a little bit later uh, to work on a child labor eradication plan. So here we agree with the households on the targets they want to set for themselves. Um, because maybe if they have three children out of school, it's quite challenging for them to bring all three children back into school at once. So you want to phase it a bit. Um, you also have to identify a source of money to pay school fees and to pay for uniforms. And if children are out of school, they often do some house work at the household itself. So you have to look at who is actually going to do the work that the children are currently doing. Then Chakalani also works, of course, on improving coffee production. But this is a long-term solution to increase income. If you have a child out of school today and you need to find money today to send that child back to school, it's not going to come now now from coffee. It is, uh, so you have to identify other sources of income. And in that way, the saving groups that we have set up in our gender program really help people to start saving money. And a lot of the saving groups also set up a social fund that farmers can access to, to pay school fees. So we see a very interesting interaction between our gender program and our stock child labor uh, program. Um, let me quickly show you some results. Um, so we have seen over 1500 children return to school 
And if I look at our key area in West Nile, we started, when we really did a full household mapping, we actually realized that we had about 50% of our households that had child labor. This was back in 2015. And we just did uh, an evaluation in 2019 and we saw that the, the percentage of households with child labor has reduced to 8%. So even after five years, we still have cases of child labor. So it's a long-term approach and you really need to be very committed to fight child labor. But we can also see huge successes of which we're very proud. Um, we have actually, uh, in this project, we have been testing out different ways to, to fight child labor and return children to school. And our approaches have helped formulate a new Utrain Forest approach on how to fight child labor, which is an, a continuous improvement approach instead of the, the old uh, zero tolerance approach. Um, the project has brought quite a lot of recognition to for us, which has been nice. And we have seen spillover to other areas. Uh, we're currently setting up uh, new projects in the Rowenzori area which is uh, quite similar in terms of poverty levels to the West Nile area. Um, important lessons that we have learned is that it's important to have that all the partners on the project have one message. A child needs to be in school. And we had to share, make sure that we had shared definitions on what is considered child labor in our uh, Ugandan uh, context because we had quite different definitions uh, coming from a social background and a private sector background, an NGO background. And uh, I think the complementarity of our approaches is a really strong element of our program. So Chakalani works very much on the income aspects and identification of child labor. Uh, the NGO works on the community awareness and involving govern governments. The teacher union works at the schools and the education quality. And local government is actually settling bylaws, for example. It's also important that uh, to know that we can't guarantee zero child labor to our clients, to you guys. Um, because even if you do a lot of efforts, you will always have a few cases that are really difficult to remediate. So you want to keep pushing these households. That's why you don't want to remove them. But it becomes almost impossible for us to promise you that we won't have child labor. Child labor is also... It's a very uh, a situation that keeps changing over time as well. Um, we've also learned that uh, scaling up takes quite a lot of time. Uh, it's easy to uh, create um, progress in a small area, but if you have to roll this out over a large area, that really takes a lot of commitment and a lot of time. And from our own side, we have learned that it's important to manage reputational risks. So in the beginning, we talked a lot about child labor. Um, but then that, that chases away a lot of our clients because they fear to buy our coffees. So now we talk more about child education because in the end that is what we want to achieve. So instead of focusing on the problem, we focus on the solution. Um, just quickly, I know that uh, Rob has put together some genuine origin coffees from Uganda for you. Uh, the coffees come from Mount Elgin and the Rowenzori, unfortunately not from, Mount, uh, from West Nile. Hopefully next time there will also be a West Nile um, genuine origin coffee for you uh, on offer. Um, here in this slide you can uh, quickly see uh, an overview of some of the details of, of the coffees that are there. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Annika. That was, was a great presentation. Um, now we're going to hear from Carlos, who's going to present on Volcafe Way. Carlos, I can see your screen. You're all set. Carlos, I can't hear you just yet. Uh, let me see if there's a problem with your mic. Carlos, you should be all set to go now. There? I can hear you. Okay, good. Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for, for joining uh, the webinar, and thanks, uh, Annika, for also laying out the really good effort that uh, you and the team are doing in, in Uganda and also for 
being straightforward on the true true challenges. Um, Rob required or asked us to speak a, a little bit about the Volca Fairway. I know it's a uh, something that you might have have already heard a little bit about, but uh, we prepared this uh, that it entails and uh, how can it add value to, to your business. So uh, I'll start a little bit with telling you a little bit of the story of how this uh, intervention or this program started. So Volcafe had, has had farmer support organizations since the 1990s and uh, these uh, organizations were basically working towards achieving the sustainable uh, certifications that back in the day were, were starting to be a, a, an important trend in the world. Um, so that was uh, in, the, in the late 1990s where we started actually focusing on the certifications and sustainability uh, programs. Then we seen that the, in the early 2000s, there was a strong trend that was starting to build up on specialty and sustainable coffees. Uh, and there was going to be now a stronger demand from the roaster side and from the consumer side on what's going on in the field. And if my cup of coffee, I, I don't only want it to be of the greatest quality available, but I also want to make sure that this is a responsible a source uh, of, of coffee uh, and we started seeing and adapting also to, to that trend and also in the 2000s we, we saw that the, the roasters were starting to build or require a more tailor-made solution or more tailor-made program that would add value specific and also uh, to meet their expectations on quality and sustainable supply chains. After all these uh, years of experience that we've had in the farmer support part, we, at the end of 2014, we gathered all the experts of sustainability of Bolt Cafe as a group, and we decided that we needed to change the way that we did the farming support and the added value proposition uh, so that we could develop a global approach on how to source sustainable and high quality Arabica coffees, which is, was the main intention back in the, back in the day. Moving a little bit on with the story, uh, in 2015, we launched the uh, Volcafe Way. Uh, remember, Volcafe Way used, Volcafe used to have farmer support organizations across uh, 14 countries. So uh, back in the day, we were working a little bit more like islands, whatever good things we were finding in Uganda, they were not necessarily translated to Colombia or to Peru. Uh, so this was also an intention from our group to start standardizing the way that we do the farmer support. Uh, in 2017, part of the evolution and an important milestone of Volca Fairway is that we created our theory of change and also we built a verification architecture based on the accountability principles. And all of this just to say that Volca Fairway is open for third party verification uh, that increases the transparency and the reliability of the information and of the impact that we're trying to build uh, based on this theory of change. Since uh, we started all the way to today, we have been now active in 10 countries uh, and hopefully we can go for, for more area and more families that we can support. Uh, all this, uh, I need also to go back to the basics and that's a, an important part. So before we get into the details of what is Bold Cafe Way and what it is not, since we know that the social and environmental performance is, is uh, uh, very important for the roaster partners, we also did our own sustainability performance scorecard, which is benchmarked with Rainforest Alliance, with Woods, with 4 on the critical non-compliances. So out of all the critical criteria, and what we may need to focus here on this slide is that out of all the critical criteria, Volca Fairway covers the exact same things that all the other sustainable supply chain standards are covering. So we are also, as Anike was saying, uh, we're also trying to defend the forest, trying to defend the wildlife, the uh, water resources, trying to do the social and environmental practices as, as good as we can. And that is also part of our internal code, which is important uh, for you guys to know here. Um, now, as, as I was saying, and before getting into what the concept is, I want to uh, 
go back to the basics and tell you a bit of the plant physiology and the importance of the new branch production in, in coffee. Uh, sorry. So hopefully I can uh, use this pen. What I want to lay out here is that coffee in the first uh, year is tough to the, that it will produce, but the important thing that I want to highlight here is that after the coffee has produced, it won't produce in the same place of the same branch ever again. So you see, hopefully you're seeing my pen and my good uh, precision here. You can see that wherever you see that coffee was grown before, you won't have coffee production again. This means that coffee will start focusing on the production only on the outermost parts of the branches, okay? And this is the importance of why we need to be able to produce new branches. It makes very little sense if you want to be a profitable farmer, it makes little sense if you are not keeping in track this behavior and these physiological aspects of the plantation. In a similar way, this can be seen uh, like this. In a dwarf variety, the normal behavior, if you plant it in the ideal coffee life zone, would be that in the third or fourth year, you will achieve the maximum potential. And after that, you will start seeing that the production goes low, and then it goes high, and then it goes low again and high again, but never to the same highest peak that we produced, basically because of the capacity that the new branches uh, uh, have. Am I still on, Rob? Yes, Carlos. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just got a message that I was off. Okay, so now what is the bulk cafe way? Uh, and uh, let me ask you this, uh, what is the purpose of any business and a coffee business? And uh, this, uh, this part I want us to do it together so that we can get to the solution on what is bulk cafe way. If you think of any for-profit company and you say, okay, what's the purpose of it, the business? Some might say, oh, it's to, to make money. Sure, to make money. Some will say, oh, it's to add value to the community or stakeholders. Sure, that's also important. So, but is it only to make money this year or is it to make money every single year that you are in the business? So for that concept, we have called that concept sustainable profitability, which means adding value to you, to your business, to your stakeholders, to your supply chain, and making this in a consistent basis. So this is where the sustainable concept for us varies a little bit from the certification sustainable concept, because this entails uh, an inclusion or a stronger inclusion on the economic part of, of the business. How would you get to achieve this sustainable profitability? In our simple term, and my intention is not to do a MBA here, but it's basically when the income is higher than the cost. The higher the income and lower the cost, the more profitable my business is. And if I get to do this every single year, then I can achieve this sustainable profits. Now, in any business, how do you calculate the income? The income will be calculated based on your production, times the price that you get. That doesn't happen only for coffee, but for any other good that you're, uh, or product or service that you're wanting to sell. The important part here, and why I went to the basics on plant physiology, is because the production side will be affected by your capacity to produce new branches in a consistent way. So since we have already learned in the previous slides that coffee is only produced on the new parts of the branches or on the new branches, my production will be linked exactly to how is my capacity to be producing new branches. And then the production will also depend on how the climate is uh, behaving. And I'm putting here in red, uh, not because I don't like the red color, but red means here that I cannot control climate. But I surely can control how can I achieve these new branches in a consistent way. Now let's go to the price section. You might think already, and you might have already uh, thought about this uh, in this uh, presentation, but price will be based on the quality of the product, 
and also on the market conditions. Again, quality and these differentiator factors, I can control, I can do something about them, but the market conditions, I really don't know. If uh, we all knew, I, I guess we wouldn't be in the trading part. Uh, so that's also in red because we cannot control it. Now let's focus now on the cost. The cost will be depending on how I decide to manage my farm. So all the labor, all the inputs, all the administrative expenses, all the harvest and post-harvest cost, everything that I need to do so that I can produce coffee on those new branches. So it, it, it would be basically how efficiently can I use the resources that I have available. Now, all this, why, why is it important? Because Bold Cafe Way, our three key performance indicators are productivity, quality, and resource efficiency here. If you see productivity is, is here in, the, in this slide, quality is here in this slide, and resource efficiency is in this slide here. What is our aim and our business proposal for farmers? We want to help you increase the income as much as possible by improving your production and your capacity of producing new branches and also by improving your quality. While we do this, we also want to help you reduce your cost as much as possible so that your resources in the farm can be used in the most efficient way, and even you can have more time to diversify your sources of income. By achieving these three indicators, the probability that you will be sustainably profitable will be higher than if you don't do this. If you see also here in the graph, the productivity, the quality, and the resource efficiency are intertwined, are linked one with each other. Why? Because a highly productive farm can have a higher high income, but also if it's not properly managed, it could have a very high cost, making it not profitable. Similar, a cup of excellence lot or winner might have the best possible quality, hence price, but could have a low production or a high cost, making it unviable in a profitability side. So the three of them have to be integrated and related in a business plan so that we can help increase the income, reduce the cost to achieve a more sustainable uh, profit. All of this is including the social and environmental aspects because uh, a responsible business has to also take care of the uh, environment of the planet and of the people and the community that uh, they work on, okay? This is the most important part of the concept that we're trying to uh, propose. Very quickly, what are the producers' challenges today? You will see it everywhere you go. Coffee growers don't know their cost of production. You go to them and ask them, they say they have no clue. They'd rather not know because they think they are losing money, etc. So they are in a business whose cost they have no, no clue about. Also, the farmers today are repeating the practices that the parents and grandparents used to do, none of which was business related or business oriented. Then there is an unbalance of the productive structure, meaning that producers, even though they know that the coffee won't, won't produce on the same part of the branch, they still are not necessarily managing the tissue in that consistent way. And lastly, and for me the most important one is that field extensionists, that provide services to coffee growers around the world, they don't have business administration knowledge. We have been training our teams to do checklist sustainability, and that is not necessarily enough for this new mindset on how to farm as a business. And it would be very irresponsible on our side if we send a, a team that, has not, uh, that doesn't have a clue on how to increase the income and reduce the cost. So that's also another challenge that producers If we try to change our mindset towards roasters or importers, what are those challenges that be that you're needing a quality and volume consistency? We also see that you would like a better customer support. We've seen that also you need a better marketing material, more pictures, better videos, more 
encourage so true impact and data. Then you might need a rival partner that will help reduce your reputational risk, uh, increase your traceability capacity, and improve your transparency as well. And at the end, you're probably looking for something that makes you credible, something that makes you different, and something that makes you unique so that you can be differentiating your product and service in your market. So let's look at this uh, slide, which is for us very important. Farmer, the main uh, goal that they have is to be sustainably profitable. Vol Cafe or ourselves uh, as a company, we are also looking for the same thing. We need to be sustainably profitable as a business. And you as roasters, you are also looking at the same thing and needing the same thing, which is this sustainable profitability. <clears throat> so our question to the entire sector is, can we truly be sustainable if we are not profitable? So what birds, what rivers, what people are you going to protect in the farm level if you end up selling your land because you were not profitable or you change the use of the soil and you end up doing any other thing? So for us, true sustainability is not only about getting to certifications, but it's also about understanding the challenges of your par partners and then try to work together seeking benefit for all through a product or a service that you can provide. Where is it that Bold Cafe Way is being applied? Is in 10 countries around the world, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and recently Papua New Guinea in the Pacific coast. Uh, we have about 284 business model farms, but this uh, approach is already being replicated by other uh, producers in the regions. Uh, and we have about 250 field team members that are actively working every single day towards achieving sustainable profitability on all these latitudes. At the end, and our main message is, let us work on what we do best so that we can also provide an added value proposition for you and also for the producers that are producing the coffee that your guys are roasting and then offering. Uh, we have a, a hashtag for Instagram and also a website. Feel free to, to check it out and follow us uh, and you can see the, the new advances that and developments that we're doing in a daily basis. Uh, thank you all for, for your time and for your uh, interest and uh, we'll be ready to receive any questions at the end of the, of the presentations. Thank you, Carlos. That was, that was a great presentation. Um, now we're going to pass it to Mattia Maguera so that he's going, to pre he's going to present on being a field technician for Vol Cafe Way in Uganda and working with farmers in Uganda firsthand. Mattia, please take it away. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, thank you, Carlos and the Dr. Anik for the wonderful presentations. Uh, good morning, everyone. And good afternoon, good evening, for wherever you are. I've a way in Uganda. Hello. Uh, cafe way in Uganda. Uh, started in 2016 after having the challenges that Carlos has discussed with the producers of uh, unbalanced structure, uh, fluctuating productions ac across farms, and we started the program to address some of these challenges in 2016 after designing, designing them, the program by, by Carlos and other implementers. Uh, it is aimed at uh, sustainable coffee farming as a business, which we include to expand our good agronomic practices trainings in demonstration plots, which we were running and which we are still running up to now, but we include in the concept of coffee farming as a business. The program started with baseline surveys where uh, we, we captured the profitability of the different farms with Uganda and we found out that uh, 
the productivity was low. So the, pro the program was to address some of these challenges. We started with identifying, establishing and managing, managing business model firms, uh, of which in Mount Elgon scheme, we have managed 14 model firms since 2016. West Nairo scheme, five business model firms, Renzori scheme, 10 business model firms, and the in commercial robust scheme, 10 business model firms, and with several replicas to the model firms within the country. Uh, we have also carried out producer trainings on coffee farming as a business, and these trainings we carry them out from business model firms. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on Mount Eregon scheme where I am best extending my services, which is located within those, the coordinates of latitude, north 57, 57, and longitude 34, 13, 4. We are running a, a scheme of 11,135 1, households organized in 445 farmer groups, of which of these households, we have ranged them in two value chains. The cherry value chain, where we source coffee as cherries fresh from the households, and we process it from our six washing stations. And also the parchment value chain, where producers cut out home processing to produce parchment, which we source into Chagalani after it is dry. Uh, the main harvest period is between August and January of every year, which is contributed by the flowering of January to March every year. Altitude of Mount Eregon operation ranges between 1,250 1, to 2,200 meters above sea level. Uh, with an average temperature of 18 to 20 degrees Celsius and an average rainfall of 1,700 to 2,300 millimeters per year. Uh, these uh, weather conditions are very favorable for Arabica growing. We are growing uh, the Arabica, or our areas of operation are in spread among Capitola, Jibuzale, which are on higher altitude. Then on a lower altitude, we have Busulani, Manafa, Busano, and Inamisindwa, operational areas. What do we do now under Voro Cafe? We organize tissue management system, which I'm calling TMS on the presentation, and the agronomic program for business model firms and their replicas of which tissue management system helps us to organize the farms into a manageable uh, uh, cycle, or rejuvenation cycle, and also uh, a, 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 manage, a, a program which solves the issue of managing the, the tissue of the plants. Uh, agronomic program, has the good agricultural practices, plus the bites and financing of those agricultural practices, which we do in the farm to increase product, uh, productivity at a lower cost so that we can attain the profits which cause as this. We call out TCA trainings. TCAs are the technical commercial assistant who are the staff whom we work with to implement coffee farming as a business. Then we also call out certification, following the certification standards which we are discussed by Dr. Anneke, and also Gronome to our producers. We call out producer trainings on coffee farming as a business, how to get profits from coffee farming from our business model farms. Then we conduct Volcafe way checklists to understand the conformance to agro, social, and environmental aspects as required by certification standards. At the end of the coffee season, 
we call out business diagnosis to, to find out the productivity of the, the businesses, the coffee business for the different producers. Then we manage the team such that we can extend our services as a team to the producers. Now, as the aim of Oka Fairway and Chagarani is to make a profit, at the end of all those activities, we call out coffee sourcing and processing, which is the core role of our business, to get a lot of volume, a lot of volume of high quality coffee, which is traded and exported. That makes up number one, exporters. Now, what part of what we do is the tissue management system and agronomic program for business model farms and replicas. In the photos, um, I point to you the best model farm of Masiga Philip, which is managed in a TMS of block, law, and three-year cycle with onion as an intercrop in that uh, the place where we have rejuvenated, we normally encourage intercropping such that the producer can be able to earn some profit as we wait for the coffee to rejuvenate and produce. Because after rejuvenate, rejuvenation, coffee loses productivity for, for one year. And after one year, it can produce again. So during that one year, we encourage poten uh, suitable intercrops, which can boost the income of the farmer. So in the photo on the top left, I can show you a block which was rejuvenated in 2019, February, which is intercropped with onion to boost the income. And on the top right, one block was rejuvenated in 2018, and another block in the middle has been rejuvenated this year in January, making a three-year cycle block and low for that business model farm. We have got many replicas to the business model farm, those that are implementing what we do at the business model farm. And I present to you one of the producers in Mount Eregon called Satya Dan, who has got a, a replica to the model farm, having T, a TMS of block, low, five-year cycle, with cabbage as an intercrop in the 2019 block. Cabbage helps him to boost, to get income from, from 2019 as he waits to the block to rejuvenate. A part of what we do is also the trainings. The photos shows our two agronomists carrying out TCA training on rejuvenation. We, we carry out both theoretical and uh, practical trainings from the field. After the trails, we have pre equipped a group of TCAs that extend uh, good services to our producers. And those are shown in the photo. Uh, one photo on the left shows one trainer from outside Uganda, Alvaro, who has helped us increase our knowledge of Okafewe. Uh, and on the right, we also have Carlos, who is also a presenter on this platform, has been here training us on several occasions to increase our knowledge of Oka Fairway before we implement the program. This is myself carrying out a producer training from a business model farm. And these are the, some of the producers who attend the, uh, the farming as a business trainings from business model farms. As I said, we manage many business model farms across the country. And this is one of the farm which we manage in West Nile scheme. What have we achieved over a period since 2016? We have managed to establish 14 business model farm in the past three years. And from these model farms, we have trained 560 producers on coffee farming as a business. We have also have had uh, several emerging replicas to the model. These are uncountable because every day they keep increasing. And we have seen a yield increase by 213% in business model farms 
from 1.6 kilos of cherry per tree as an average in 2016 to 5 kilograms of cherry per tree in two, 2019 as an average. Profitability has also increased by 238% in business model firms and replicas. Farmers are now better managing their farms at a low cost after training them uh, the, the efficiencies. We are also having an improve, improved quality of coffee. This has been shown by the increase in cherry weight from 1.6 grams per cherry to 2.2 average gram weight of each cherry in business model farms and replicas. We have also seen an increase in, in among our washing stations from within the outturns. That is the conversion from cherry to parchment, where outturns have increased from five to an average of 4.7 in the past two in the past three years, staff capacities have also increased on coffee farming as a business. So I present to you one of the farms of Mwende Martin. The app looked in 2016 before our services and 2019, this is how the farm has been looking after our services. Uh, a simple, KPI, which is the performance indicator. Under the productivity, we saw we, uh, we, when we came to this farm, it was only 0 0.5 kilos of cherry per plant. That it was in 2016, which increased to 4.5 kilograms of cherry per plant in 2018. And now, the, the season which we've ended in 2019, we have gotten 5.5 kilos of cherry per plant. And the quality of cherry has improved from 1.6 grams weight per cherry to 2.2 grams weight per cherry in 2019. In 2016, it means you we needed 625 cherries to make one kilo of cherry. And right now in 2019, we needed only 454 cherries to make one kilo. Efficiencies have increased in 2016 we had a profit of 462,000 Uganda shillings. 2018, the profit increased after increasing the efficiencies to 651,000 Uganda shillings. And up to 2019, where we have had a profit from this farm of 1,102,500 Uganda shillings per acre. All these improvement has been as a result of improvement in productivity and also improvement in efficiency of managing operations in the farm. That is a simple demonstration of the increase in the cherry weight. Uh, these are 22 grams from 10 cherries, on average of 2.2 grams per cherry. After our services, uh, this is one model business model farm family of Charles Nangai with a better productivity, a better life, as indicated by the smiles on their faces. We also have another business model farm of Mr. Koneka Richard. The one on the left with sun, photo taken this season, 2019-2020. Uh, however, amidst all this, we've had some challenges. One is mindset change. Uh, most of the producers are stick to old technologies of growing coffee. So bringing in new technologies, they feel like changing from what they learned from their grand and grandparents. Then also there is failure to follow the tissue management system in early stages. Some producers are very fast at adopting that when they see the first block is improving and producing well, they want to finish everything by, they want to rejuvenate the whole farm at once, yet they would like to have a cycle, a planned such that uh, we can have, we balance the tissues that rejuvenate an equal amount of plants per year. Uh, most producers don't want to follow this. There is also farmer illiteracy and reluctance to keep records. Uh, most of the Ugandan farmers are not educated 
as a doctor discussed the challenges of education. Uh, most farmers are not educated, so keeping records is a challenge because they cannot read and write. Uh, some others are educated, can read and write, but they are just reluctant to keep records. So it is very difficult for, for them and for us to follow the expenses and the incomes at the end of the coffee season, so we cannot calculate the productivity. Then, uh, any precedingly, a low drought in 2019. Last year, we had a very long drought, which started all the way from December 2018 and continued to April 2019, which affected qualities of most farms and also the volumes from these farms. Uh, in conclusion, I see Volcafe Way as an amazing strategy for sustainable coffee profitability. Thank you all. That was all for my presentation. Thank you, Mattia. Um, and now we have just a few minutes left for questions and answers. Uh, if you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, you can submit questions. We already have a few. Um, I'll jump right in. Uh, a question for Annika. Um, are the coffees in genuine origin on, on the genuine origin website traceable and sourced from producers participating in these programs that you spoke about? Yes, Rob, there all of our coffees are fully traceable. Um, in Mount Elgin, we actually use digital traceability apps and, and in the rest of the areas we use paper traceability systems. Um, so all the purchases that we make from individual farmers are, are recorded. At our washing stations, we buy the coffees per lots or batches. Uh, a batch is about one to two days of purchases. So for every batch, we, we have records from which individual farmers we bought. Normally a batch in Mount Elgin might uh, be bought from between somewhere like 80 and 120 farmers. So we can track that back. Uh, in the parchment groups, uh, we also record all the purchases um, uh, that we make from our parchment farmers against their production estimates. So all the coffees we buy are always traced against uh, the production estimate of farmers. So at the end of the season, we know exactly how much coffee we have bought from every individual farmer. Um, so at the washing stations, we keep the lots separate. Uh, for the parchment group, uh, those volumes are generally going to larger buyers. So we keep those volumes separate by small area within the scheme. So in the Mount Elgin area, we have about six parchment areas, which we keep all separate. Um, but we won't uh, keep individual lots separate the whole, the whole season. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, Carlos, for you, um, many of our uh, Genuine Origin customers are smaller roasters, they're independent roasters. How can an independent roaster get involved or, or participate in the Vol Cafe Way program? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, uh, Rob. Thank you. And also, well, before I, I want to also congratulate Matia, it's been amazing to see him present and also the development and growth he's had since uh, five years that I know him and uh, well, well done, Matia. Uh, back to your question, Rob, there's a million ways that we, uh, smaller roasters can get involved. Uh, we have a specific uh, particular example of a nursery project that we started with one genuine origin uh, uh, partner or roaster that is buying coffee from us there. And uh, he said, uh, well, you know, I want to uh, promote more nurseries in this specific region, I can give you the funding and you can then provide the, the you can build the nursery and also make sure that it's going to be uh, implemented with the bulk of airway methodology on producers that are sourcing my coffee. Uh, and so we built the nursery with the Guatemalan team and we also will be showcasing pictures of this nursery to this uh, specific poster and he's using it already on his social media and on his uh, instagram posts and all this feed that has been also helping them create a stronger brand value on showing that they also have the boots on the ground uh, we've done also a uh, water uh, weather stations so again another a roaster said, okay, I want to uh, help you to collect the data of the, of the field so that we, we would install these stations. 
so there's a lot of uh, needs that can be done. And also there's a lot of promotional material that can be extracted to add value to the roster from these uh, partnerships as well. Uh, it's not a written in stone and it's something that we can keep on co-developing together uh, depending on what the needs are. And we can also be creative and then uh, make sure that we add value to producer, to the roster and also to, to ourselves. So uh, endless possibilities. It would be just a matter of just uh, doing the brainstorm and then see how we can make it happen for them. That's great, Carlos. Um, and Mattia, uh, working on the ground in Uganda, uh, what points of resistance are you meeting when you approach farms? That's to say, if you go to, to a farm and say, I can help you, I can help you implement a program that will make you more profitable, are some farmers just resistant and tell you, I, I don't want to work with you? And, and how do you overcome that? It's come, it comes with uh, uh, the indication, uh, profitability calculation of how the farm can earn more profits when they take our services. So we have to go into calculations that if I'm implementing a tissue management system of block or low a five year cycle, within the third year, fourth year, or after finishing the tissue management system, this is how much average profitability you can get from your farm. So um, it takes us to go into the calculations of profitability to convince that farmer to undertake our initiative of coffee farming as a business. That's great, and I have, I have, uh, I think we have time for just uh, one, one more question. I wanted to ask Carlos. Um, Carlos, can can we get can we get updates through through Genuine Origin? Obviously, I, I think some roasters would be very interested to hear periodic updates, um, maybe maybe on some kind of schedule. Um, mm -hmm. And and maybe media assets that, that people can share. I think it, our our customers tend to be very involved in their coffee and and want to understand mm -hmm. where it's coming from, what the factors of production are, um, and we're wondering if if you can if if we can work together to make sure that we get a, a constant feed of of um, of updates from Volcano. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also a great uh, question, Rob. Uh, and uh, we wanted to position ourselves as is to be the strategic partner of uh, roasters, right? So for that, we have to be able to listen to what they they are requesting and also try to provide that. We've seen that there's a a lot of a need of uh, educating or giving more information of what the true reality is in the field for these roasters, so that they can help change the trend on social environmental performance towards a more uh, impact-based uh, sustainability. So it's in our best interest to help on promoting, on showing the information, on, on, on sending out some newsletters. Uh, part of this year's uh, idea, five years already on implementation, we have a lot, and when I say a lot, it's uh, already about uh, near to a thousand farms that we have been already implementing around the world. So we have a lot of experience and a lot of uh, material that we want to start sharing after the concept has been proven to be working because of the amount of years that we have in. Uh, that said, yes, the idea is to start uh, working more uh, collaboratively with you uh, to start building these newsletters and reports so that you and your team can start uh, showcasing that to the strategic partners that they've chosen and also uh, bring the level of the conversation to a higher uh, level so that we can also start tackling the other important challenges that we see. Uh, but now having a common mindset of what those challenges truly are. So by all means, uh, yes, it's, it's on the plan and we might need your help to make it happen, but yes. <laughs> OK, 